Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my video review of the Fujinon XF 33mm F1.4 RLMWR, and I'll break down what that means in just a moment. Now, instead of showing you the lens in front of you, I actually am filming on it. I wanted to do this because it's been a little while since I've actually filmed any reviews on a Fuji camera because in times past, it would be so inconsistent for tracking my face. But I thought it'd be a good time to show how that Fuji has really advanced a long way in this. So I'm filming on the X-H2 at the moment with the 33mm f1.4. Now, the XF 33mm f1.4 is Fuji's fourth normal prime lens in that they've had three previous with a slightly different focal length of 35 millimeters. 33 millimeters actually more closely corresponds to the 50 millimeter or normal standard. And so this is, in some ways, this is the truest normal lens. If, if you consider a 50 millimeter, the normal standard, this is the closest to what they have had to this point. Now, it is the largest and the most expensive of these four lenses to date. However, it is also the most consistently good of the four. It combines a still compact size with very good, and I will note very balanced optic, uh, optical performance. It has good autofocus with their linear motor autofocus system, and it has a very nice build. However, it is also, as noted, the most expensive at around 800 US dollars. And so is this lens worth that asking price? Well, we'll answer that question in this review right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that is now even better with the new Phantom X that is crafted from aluminum right here in Canada. It is 22% smaller and 35% lighter, while still making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. You could even customize your wallet due to its modular design, with accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even Chipolo and AirTag tracking integration. Visit store.phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. And use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So to break down what the naming initials mean, so R refers to aperture ring or ring, and so in this case we have Fuji standard approach to aperture in that you have an aperture uh, iris that can be controlled either manually or from within the camera. If you control it manually, there are one third stop to tenths with markings at the full aperture stops, in this case f1.4, f2, f2.8, and so on. And what we don't have, however, is a declick option, which has become more and more standard on some other brands, the ability to declick that aperture. LM stands for linear motor, which refers to the focus system, which we'll get to in just a moment. WR refers to the fact that it has weather resistance, and so that has a gasket at the rear mount and also some internal seals inside as a part of that, giving us a premium build and a premium design here. As noted, this is a little bit larger and heavier than some of the predecessors, However, this is still a quite a moderately sized lens. It is 67 millimeters in diameter with a 58 millimeter front filter thread and just 73 and a half millimeters long. That's 2.6 inches by 2.9 inches. And it weighs in at 360 grams or 12.7 ounces. This is still a lens you're easily going to be, be able to carry all day and shoot with and not get bogged down with the weight of it. It is slightly larger and heavier than the two um, XF mount 33mm f1.4 alternatives. There's one from Viltrox, also one from Tokina. Very slightly heavier and larger than those, but as you can see in this picture of it next to the Viltrox, it is subtle enough that you might not quickly pick that up. It's definitely not anything major in one direction or the other. Beyond the aperture ring, there is the manual focus ring and it moves smoothly with a reasonable amount of damping, though as always, this is focused by wire. So it's you know not going to feel like a true manual focus lens. There is a very nice finish. It's a durable metal, uh, feels good. But the one kind of exception to the quality of the build is the lens hood itself. The lens hood is plastic and, so it, and it doesn't even have a completely matching finish. And so it feels a little bit discordant, like it's tacked on. And I also note that the kind of finish that it does have seems to be really prone to picking up fingerprints and also marks along the way. So I would have preferred it to be more of a matching finish, kind of like what Viltrox did with their much less expensive 33 millimeter F1.5. Four. Also in the negative column is not so much a deviation from the pattern of what we've seen from this type of Fuji lens in the past, but more that we haven't deviated from that pattern and that we still have 
really no features outside of the aperture ring on the lens itself. There's nothing like a the equivalent of a Sony or Canon focus hold button, as noted no D-click options. There's not really any of these other features that have become more and more standard. And when you consider that this is a lens that retails for 800 US dollars, it seems like an omission at this point. It's time for Fuji to kind of raise the bar or at least meet the standard that's being set by other manufacturers. Inside, we have nine rounded aperture blades that does quite a good job of maintaining a circular shape, as you can see as it's stopped down. Also, we have a minimum focus distance of 30 centimeters, giving us a maximum magnification of 0.15 times. That's about average for a 50 millimeter-ish lens, which is what this essentially is but it's nothing exceptional. But when you compare it to the other 33 millimeter F1.4 options from Viltrox or Tokina, both of those have a really substandard 0.1 times magnification. It makes it look pretty good by comparison. Let's talk about autofocus for a moment. We do have the linear focus motor here as a part of this design. And I will note that the autofocus is quite snappy on the X-H2. As you can see here, it's making even major focus changes with you know good quickness there and not any kind of pulsing or hunting. I will note that when the motor itself seems quite quiet, but what isn't completely quiet is the aperture blades. And so you'll hear them kind of clicking or snapping and making some noise as they open and close during the actual autofocus process. Also, I found that there was very good eye stickiness. You can see from this shot that as I pan around around Nala, that obviously it grabs the eye as soon as the eye is available and it tracks it very efficiently as I move around with the camera. Also, when it came to doing my hand test, the stickiness was so much that I actually had a hard time, as you can see, getting it to move away from my, my face. And so I basically had to obscure my face altogether before focus would shift from it. And so obviously eye stickiness being a strength, and I did find that IAF worked well with several different subjects over the course of my review. And so that's a technology that certainly has been improved by Fuji. And of course, the fact that they, they now have the AI learning really helps with predictive tracking of those things, which has made a huge difference in that overall stickiness and which is a big part of why I feel confident filming on a Fuji camera, which I didn't in times past. I'll also, also note that my focus pulls were nicely damped and quiet. You will see that there is just a little bit of a step there at the end. It's as if focus gets to a certain point, pauses just for a split second, and then it kind of does that final little pull to the final destination point. On the plus side, I see very, very little focus breathing there. And so that is a plus for those that want to do video with a lens like this. Overall, while this isn't the best focus uh, performance that I've ever seen, it certainly is competitive with what I'm seeing with a lot of other lenses. And so I would say that we're certainly making progress from what I saw in times past. This is a much smoother, more sophisticated focus experience than what I've seen from the older Fuji Prime lenses in the past. So how about the optical performance? This is a lens that I actually really enjoyed. Uh, I felt like it struck a very good balance between sharpness and overall rendering. And so we're gonna dive in and we're gonna break down how this holds up even when put against the very challenging 40 megapixel sensor of the X-H2. Let's take a look. So first of all, we'll take a look at vignette and distortion here. So on the left, I have an uncorrected raw image. On the right, I have what would be automatically corrected. Now, as I like to do, I like to dial in a manual correction, which we've now got on the right, because that allows me to actually get under the hood and see what would be required for correction and how linear or non-linear distortion is. So you can see a bit of pincushion distortion here and also some vignette in the corners. Let's crack that open and see what it takes to fix. Now, as you can see, the distortion was very linear in nature. I was able to get a very clean manual correction at minus five. And then also we can see here that vignette is at a plus 62. So that's right under two and a half stops. And, and so not anything too terrible or right around two and a half stops, I would say. And you can see also it was not, it's fairly linear as well. So easy to correct and also means that it can give you a decent look if you so want it uh, in certain images. Now, I didn't see any kind of longitudinal chromatic aberrations pop up in real-world images, and so when I went hunting for them, I really didn't find a whole lot. And so we've got some you know, bright, shiny surfaces here, and then we've also got an out-of-focus window. No issue there. 
uh, if I take a look here where we've I've got some shiny and reflective surfaces, we can see that there is a little bit of a fringing in kind of the bokeh region there. And so, but again, not very pronounced overall, fairly neutral. So a pretty strong performance there. Then if we look for lateral chromatic aberrations near the edge of the frame, there is no correction that's on here. And so this is just out of the camera. We can see that there is only the slightest, slightest hint of any kind of lateral chromatic aberration. So it's not going to be any kind of real world issue at all. So here's a look at my test chart that will get our results for our overall resolution and contrast here. Now I will note that the 40 megapixel resolution point on an APS-C sensor is basically the most demanding sensor that I've actually ever tested anything on in terms of pixel density. So this is a serious challenge. Now I will note one other thing, for at least the wide open results, I've gone the extra layer of doing an enhanced work in um, in Lightroom here. If we look at 200% magnification, which is the way that I do these tests, you can see that on the right that, you know, when you go to sharpen Fuji images, sometimes it can get just a little bit squirrely. It's not as bad as what it used to be, but if you go to the enhanced, um, it does give you just a little bit cleaner result. And so I'm going to use that for the wide open just to give us a benchmark. Uh, it just gives you a little bit cleaner sharpening and overall end result. If we take a quick look at the MDF chart, it suggests a very sharp center and then a significant drop towards the center and then kind of a flat line over to the edge. Looking at our actual test chart, we can see that the center of the frame does look very nice and crisp, even at f1.4, even at this very high resolution point. And we can see that, yes, uh, the mid frame is not as crisp and not as high contrast as what we saw. But then if we go down towards the corner, we can see that, yes, it is virtually about the same here as it is down here. So not really any kind of significant fade towards the edges. So if I compare to the one point of comparison I do have on hand, which is the Viltrox 33 millimeter f1.4, exact same specs basically here, we can see that the Fuji is the easy winner here. The Viltrox looks much more mushy by comparison, even though I've also got the enhanced version here. That's true in the center. It's true in the mid frame. It is true down into the corner as well. So definitely, you know, this is a case of probably you get what you pay for here. Now a test chart at 200% can be a bit murder, so let's take a look at how that looks in the real world. Here at f1.4, we can see on Ferrari here, that's a very crisp result, 40 megapixels. That's very demanding, but yet it's doing a really great job there. Uh, we can take a look here, at this lichen or moss growing along on the rock. You can see once again, very, very good. Contrast is not bad at all. And uh, you can see a nice transition to defocus as well, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. Some early spring buds here, and we can see if we go into 100% magnification, we've got nice detail popping up there. Uh, so good results so far. And then here's a nighttime image, a little bit higher ISO, obviously, uh, because of shooting at night. But we can see that if we go into a pixel level, even at f1.4, we've got you know quite good detail and uh, certainly usable contrast throughout the image. And so very, very useful amount of resolution. It's actually a very good match for this higher resolution sensor. One final wide open result, kind of one of my nature shots here, and you can see very nice crisp detail and contrast there. A very nice looking image. So going back to the test, and now I'm going to use the non-enhanced just to give you a point of comparison as we stop down. We can see that f at f1.8, there's a little bit more contrast. Um, you can see just a little bit more detail there in the mid frame. If we pop down into the corner, you can definitely see a significant improvement in the contrast and that we're starting to get a little bit more detail resolving there at the edge of the frame. Moving on down to f2, we can see that that improves just a little bit further. And at f2.8, we're just starting to get more detail. We'll pop back to the center here. Center looking fantastic here at f2.8. And we can see now that the mid frame is starting to look a lot better. You can just see more detail starting to uh, show up in different spots in the frame as we begin to stop on down from f2.8 to f4, just a little bit more pop there. It's really more in the corner where we're starting to see the detail, as you can see comparing here and here, for example, that the detail is just starting to get stronger and stronger. 
So if we check back in with the Viltrox here at F4, we can see that in the center of the frame, the Viltrox has improved considerably. It's now quite sharp, very good contrast, um, and you know, it's fairly comparable to the Fuji. That's true also in the mid frame here on the right side though. The Fuji obviously is delivering just kind of a brighter, better contrast result, just a little bit cleaner looking. Down in the corner, however, the Viltrox is much weaker by comparison. And also I did note that if I look kind of at the centering, that the Fuji is definitely the better lens in terms of consistency on both sides of the frame there. You know, a more expensive lens sometimes results in a better optical design and a little bit more consistent quality control. Now going back to real world results here at f5.6, we can see that in the center of the frame, we're just getting lots and lots of information in all of these, you know, different pine needles and bare branches right off to the edge of the frame. We've got nice detail here. This is a lens now that is going to really deliver for landscape type images or smaller aperture images. Now on the high resolution bodies like this, I would typically look at about f8 as the limit is how high I'd want to go before you start to experience diffraction. And as you can see here, our minimum aperture is f16, but you can see that there's been a serious hit even compared to f1.4 in terms of contrast and the ability to ren render fine details. Diffraction is just a physical reality that on a high resolution body is going to really punish you. And so I would use as a practical range when at all possible, go from f1.4 to about f8 eight here if you're using the high resolution bodies. Now our minimum focus distance of 30 centimeters and maximum magnification of 0.15 is nothing particularly impressive. That's what I would consider about average for a 50 millimeter lens on full frame, which is, is the equivalent of. Uh, it does deliver quite good performance up close. You know, contrast details pretty good. Um, you know, contrast could be a little bit better, but really not too bad. Where this kind of shines though is in comparison to the either the Viltrox 33 millimeter f1.4 or the Tokina 33 millimeter f1.4. 1.4, the two kind of main exact competitors, both of those lenses only deliver a 0.10 times. And so this is obviously a much use, more useful figure than that. And if I take a look at a real world shot here, you can see that it's enough to get close and to really blur out a background. And with a real world three dimensional object, you know, contrast isn't off the charts. It's not at macro level, but there's a nice amount of detail there in the very narrow plane of focus and obviously a very nice defocus beyond that. Taking a quick look here at the geometry of the lens, wide open f1.4, very nice bokeh circles in the center of the frame, some deformation towards the edge of the frame, though not extreme. You can see that they become more oval than completely cat eye. Uh, stopping on down to f2, we can see that we're starting to get a little bit more consistent circular shape across the frame. It's not really until f2.8, however, that you get close to you know, full circles all across the frame. If that's something that's a priority to you, we can see that we are retaining a nice circular shape. You can very vaguely see the nonagonal shape of the nine aperture blades, but it is pretty well masked. And so a uh, byproduct is, is this lens uh, aperture is doing quite a good job when it comes to specular highlights like this. Now we've seen if you're really up close, you can really blur out a background. This is a really complex shot here uh, with a lot of hard edges and it's, you know, not completely free from some jitter, but overall I would say that that has handled that uh, setting quite well. And if we look again in more friendly settings like this, we've got good detail on the subject, the lock here, um, you know, looks nice, good contrast on the subject. And then the, the, you know, blur in the background looks nice. Here's stop down to F2.8. Obviously that's gonna deliver even higher resolution and contrast. But what we can also see is that we've got those nice round circular shapes everywhere we look in the specular highlights. Here's a monochrome and uh, of the lock here. So you have a very fine, um, line of, you know, your depth of field. I think this is an Acros um, profile here. And byproduct is that, you know, you have a really nice look, look to defocus. And this is kind of what people love about Fuji is the ability to have some of these film, film simulations and to get shots like this that look maybe like they were taken on film. Finally, uh, taking a quick look at putting the sun into the frame. It's not a completely exempt from flare artifacts. I've seen very little in terms of actual like ghosting artifacts, but you can see that we do have some loss of contrast. Uh, I frankly, it looks somewhat artistic in this shot. And so I didn't see anything that was critical during my review period. So in summation, this is a lens that yes, is heavier and it's more expensive. 
than what we've seen both from Fuji previously and then also with the third party competitors. But I also feel like this is a better lens. It is more sophisticated, it's more nuanced, and it delivers frankly nicer image quality than what I have seen from any of the other competitors in the past. The cheap, cheaper competitors, I can't speak for the Tokina, but certainly for the Viltrox, it's just not really in the same class. And we found that for the centering, I also found just in the general nuance of color rendition, the Fuji colors are just so much nicer than what the older Viltrox lens was. I think Viltrox is getting much better in this regard. And if their recent uh, Pro uh, AF 75 millimeter F1.2 is any indication, they're moving into a, the next level of their lens design. But at least on that 33 millimeter, I just feel like the Fuji is delivering much more pleasing images to my eye. I think the probably the best plus that I could give to this lens or praise that I could give to it is the fact that it is on my personal short list. I'm actually planning on buying the X-H2. It's the camera body from Fuji that you know finally checks enough of the boxes that I feel like it's what I would like to own uh, for testing on but also for using in the APS-C space. And so the XF 33mm f1.4 is certainly on my own personal short list of Fuji lenses that I would like to acquire in the future. And if I'm ready to open my own wallet and buy it, I would say that's probably the highest praise that I could give it. This is a lens that I think is going to delight a lot of people if you're willing to save up just a little bit more and get what I think is the better lens. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my uh, full text review there, also to an image gallery if you want to look at some of the photos that I've taken with it. There's some buying links there if you'd like to purchase one. Also linkage to follow myself or Craig on social media. You can become a patron, get channel merchandise, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.